Our next speaker is Dr. Troy Lunn from the University of Minnesota. Uh, he will be speaking about brain engraftment, biomarkers, and transplant. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Troy Lunn. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, happy to see everybody again. It's my favorite meeting of the year. And I'll try to present some uh, new additional data on the stuff we're working on in mice and in patients. All right, these are my disclosures. So there's been uh, some new exciting developments in understanding a engraftment of the brain. Uh, a recent paper published this year in Blood Advances was able to measure this, and I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, just a little background of what the study was. These are females who underwent bone marrow transplant for some reason, probably leukemia. Uh, they died at some point after transplant. They received cells from a male donor, um, and then after they died, they had an IRB-approved brain autopsy. And so I'm not going to go into all the details of the technology that it takes to do this, but suffice to say, on brain sections, you can actually develop a stain for the cells we think uh, engraft the brain called microglia, and that can be a green stain as shown here in the upper right hand, your upper left hand corner. You can also have a special stain for the Y chromosome, and that turns out to be a red dot. And so you can figure out all the Y chromosomes in the brain that came from the male donor, and you can figure out all the microglia in the brain, and then you can overlay these stains. And it's pretty much as simple as that. And then you can count them, and you can do this through repetitive sections, and you can figure out exactly how many donor cells made it up into that person's brain. And so incidentally, we tried, we tried to do this years ago, and the techniques are um, very, very difficult, but this lab was able to refine them and, and pull it off. Uh, nice. Thanks. So what do the numbers look like? So what is the percent in graphment? that we're getting in the brain. So on the y-axis is the percent engraftment, and on the x-axis is the chemotherapy. So standard busulfan-based chemo, you get about 8%, and that's what we expect to see. Um, when we do low-dose chemo in people, you almost get nothing, so a percent or so. We're gonna ignore group three because they're not relevant. And then some females had two transplants for one reason or another, they actually had twice as much brain engraftment. So for reasons I'll show you in a minute. Here, this shows the days after transplant that the person had died and the brain autopsy was performed. And the average time frame was about three months. So all this data comes from three months after transplant, except for the persons with two transplants, where it was a bit longer, more variable. Let's see, advance. All right, so we thought, why don't we try to replicate this? We already had half of it done, so after reviewing this paper, we thought we should just finish it. So let's test this in mice and see what results we get. Um, and our goal was really to replicate the human data, and then ultimately, why would you want to do that? Well, because in our lab, we try to figure out new and better ways to do transplant and graft the brain. Um, uh, and so that's why you got to have a good model. So we use our standard models just using a green mouse and transplanting the marrow cells from the green mouse into a black mouse and looking to see where all the green cells go. Most of them go to the marrow. Some of the cells go to the brain. It's as simple as that. So this is the cross-section of a mouse brain after transplant, about a month after transplant. And these are the anatomic regions I've outlined here. And then all the colored dots are we went through by hand and colored any green cell. Um, so the, the dots are our coloring of them. So all the yellow dots are cells we found in the back of the brain. Purple dots are up in the cerebellum. All those dots are thalamus. We've also outlined the cortex, corpus callosum. And so we broke this down anatomically. And we just counted everything we saw. 
And just so you can better understand what this looks like, this is a, a section of cortex, and you can see the green. That's the actual engrafted green donor cell. And our blue circle is a blue ring we put around that, and that's how we count them. And we do this over and over and over. Eventually, we developed a technique to do this on a machine so it wasn't so labor-intensive. So what does the data look like uh, in mice as compared to humans? It looks like this. So the experiment on your left is two doses of radiation. We are looking at three months after transplant, just like in the human study. We used a high dose, which is standard, nine gray. We get about 8% engraftment. So the numbers line up uh, extremely well and to our surprise. When we reduce the dose of radiation by 50%, we lose about tenfold in brain engraftment. So hardly any cells engraft when you go down in the dose. Uh, we don't use radiation in transplant anymore, so we use busulfan. And so then we went to our busulfan model and we gave standard dose, uh, which is 100 milligrams of busulfan. Uh, we looked at brain engraftment and we find again, it's in that eight to 12% range. We get a little bit higher with busulfan. If you cut that dose in half, we actually lose about tenfold in brain engraftment. So, um, so that was surprising to see that there's a definite chemotherapy threshold to engrafting the brain. And then finally we thought, well, why don't we put mice through two transplants? Uh, they were 30 days apart and see what we got. A little bit different than the human data is that we can get almost 80% engraftment in the data, but there was a problem with doing that type of experiment. We lost 70% of the mice. So in no way, shape, or form will two transplants become the standard because the mortality from it is just too high. So the remaining mice engrafted fantastically, but uh, most of the mice succumb to toxicity. So from this part, uh, we, turn, we can say that the brain does not engraft very easily. Uh, we know now that chemotherapy is uh, absolutely required to engraft the brain. And in these experiments, it always seems that more is better. Unfortunately, you do reach a toxicity point. Um, radiation uh, is also very useful, except again, no, none of our regimens anymore, and probably for the last 15 years or more have had any radiation, uh, unless you had leukemia. Um, otherwise, we don't use radiation. And then the time for brain engraftment is probably roughly about three months. So these experiments were all set up to mimic the human trial, which was at three month time point. That's probably about the time brain engraftment is really starting to occur um, in that three to six month window. And I always, I always put, what happens after that? We just don't know, because we have not carried experiments out much further than that. Uh, whether these cells go in and rapidly divide and take over the brain, not clear. Uh, whether there's continuous brain engraftment over a period of years, also not clear and not known. Uh, these are still questions we're trying to answer. So now let's switch gears, talk about biomarkers. Because ultimately, we want to figure out what are these cells doing in the brain and, and how do we see their outcomes? Um, you know, these are all mouse experiments, so you can sacrifice the mice and look, but in reality, we need biomarkers. So looking inside the brain is hard. There are methods to do this. You know, the most obvious one is getting the MRIs pre-transplant and post-transplant. Um, the next one is sometimes we get cerebral spinal fluid from patients and we can look at biomarkers in that fluid. It's the closest fluid to the brain, so it yields very robust biomarkers. But of course, blood-based biomarkers would be ideal. So I'm going to talk about uh, some new findings on neurofilament light chain. I'll first describe what it is. It's a very popular topic. There are now hundreds of papers on it. How it is used, and then what about it with ALD? First of all, what is it? Uh, in the bottom left, that's a neuron. A neuron has shape. So the things that gave the shape to the cell are structural proteins, like the scaffolding of a building. So neural filament light chain is part of that scaffolding. Uh, it's made up 
it's a long chain made up of monomers, and you can see this is kind of how it's all put together. It's overlapping fibrils of these monomers that are all wrapped up together and put in an anti-parallel matter, and it kind of makes this rope formation. And this is one of the many proteins that give the cells their shape, including all these branches of neurites and shape of the cell body. So you can think of it as the scaffolding of the cell. So what else do we need to know about it? Well, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we've uh, discovered that if neurons are damaged, they release some of the scaffolding out in their environment because cells break open upon damage. And that uh, release allows neural filament light chain to get in the CSF in, in pretty good concentration. But what's interesting about this protein, unlike others, is that it actually crosses the blood-brain barrier and you can find it in the circulation. So it's actually a bloodstream marker of neuronal damage. Uh, it's very low in concentration, so it took a lot of different evolutions in technology to be able to measure it. Because we tried to measure this six, seven years ago by standard methods, and we just couldn't. The technology wasn't there to measure it. But now through advances in sin single molecule measuring technology and advanced techniques, we can actually reliably measure it uh, in the bloodstream uh, over and over. So it took that long, and this figures from a paper that describes the evolution of that technology. So there are literally, literally now hundreds of papers about this biomarker, because uh, it's nice to be able to measure something in the blood. Uh, people are very active in multiple sclerosis, uh, researching this as a biomarker of disease. Uh, if you have a head injury, it also goes up as a biomarker. Um, it's, it's getting a lot of press about uh, in the regulatory sense as there have been drugs uh, for ALS approved based on their effect on this biomarker. Um, and I could go on and on, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, car accidents, stroke, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there have been a few papers in the ALD field about the biomarker. Uh, so our, our colleagues uh, in Europe have published a very nice paper early on a few years ago about establishing it uh, as being higher in kids with cerebral disease. Uh, and then we published our follow-up paper. Uh, you know, the first paper focused more on AMN. We focused on childhood disease, and we had a few patients post-transplant. And then in a large international effort uh, between the groups in uh, Amsterdam, Germany, Boston, Minnesota, you know, published again a follow-up uh, establishing this as a robust biomarker. So uh, those results are all out there. I can just show you a few of the examples of what it looks like. This is from our paper looking at neurofilament in control boys and boys with cerebral disease. We see a fold increase of about tenfold. That's pretty robust. And um, you can see it's not perfect. There's overlap between the groups, is what I always try to point out. It's not a perfect biomarker, because you know, some patients just overlap with others. And then in Weinover's paper, um, I just wanted to point out the adults here. Adult controls have a certain level. If you have AMN, the level's a bit higher. And if you're an adult with uh, active cerebral disease, it is much higher. So again, going back to the robustness of this biomarker. And so a few more pieces of data, again, recently from the Weinover paper, is that if you look at um, boys who are asymptomatic with ALD, they're the green, very low in their neural filament light chain. If they develop cerebral disease, uh, as seen on MRI, shown in orange, they have higher levels. That's if their score is less than 2.5. And for boys with a higher score of greater than 2.5, they even have higher levels of neurofilament light chain. So there's also a correlation to the amount of disease burden uh, and the amount of uh, neurofilament in your blood. And, so, um, and then from our work, we published post-transplant neurofilament light chain. And we do see a nice declination uh, of neurofilament light chain after transplant. It does take a while. It does take at least a year to see those levels get down, so it's not immediate. And the pilot data demonstrated to us is that we can cut those levels uh, in half or so. So for new stuff, we're constantly revisiting and trying to refine these models. Um, so we looked at new panels of biomarkers, 
And I'm not going to go through all the details of the panels. Let's just say we looked at neurofilament light chain and then threw in 20 other things, so new and different markers. And you have to do a lot of complicated multivariate analyses to figure out which is the best marker. So when you do that, you can figure out that some markers interact with each other. So maybe VEGF A could interact with uh, biomarker B, maybe GFAP interacts with C, and you look at those interactions mathematically and you put them on a grid. And the tighter that they interact, the more intense the color on the grid. So we're looking for a red color, basically, because those are the tight interactions. For us, we wanted to know what interacted with the less score the best. So we put the less score across the top, and then all the other biomarkers file underneath. And you can see there are a couple of red ones here and here. The rest, those are the only important ones that we found. The rest of them we can dispense with because they, were, they just weren't um, statistically significant or they weren't strong enough. And so again, through multivariate analysis of, of patients uh, going into transplant, once again, we find out of all the markers, out of all 20, neurofilament light chain went right to the top. Nothing else really mattered. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> for us, it expressed again, uh, this, once you see this biomarker coming up after study after study, uh, you give it a lot more credit, it's a lot more robust. Um, and so in this new set of patients, which hadn't been looked at, um, yeah, this is what we find. So we can, so that's two different analyses. Now we can just kind of plot this data uh, with narrow filament on the uh, x-axis, less score on the y-axis, and you can see there's the line. So that's the, the line, the correlation line between the two bits of data. Uh, many of the dots line up on the line nicely, but not all of them. And that's the problem with some of these biomarkers is that it remains not predictive for everybody. Even though there's a nice line, there's nice mathematics, everything looked very beautiful, not all the dots are perfectly there. But again, out of all the biomarkers, this one was the best one. And so that was great. So what happens to these biomarkers after transplant? So in a subset of allo patients, we looked at what happens to these biomarkers, or looked at neurofemalite chain. Now, the way I'm showing this data is not in the raw values, because everybody has a different level, but instead I'm showing it as change from the baseline. So if you came in with a biomarker level of 400 pre-transplant, and then you went down, and if you doubled it to 800, that would be a 100% increase. If you went down to 200, that would be a 50% decrease. And so because of the, it's so individual, that's a better way to display the data is within each patient what happened. And so if you look six months post-transplant, more or less the biomarker uh, stays the same. So neurofilament light chain is probably about the same, if not even elevated uh, to higher levels. And this is probably due to the inflammation after transplant that we see. And again, we've shown this before, we don't see much decrease. It's only really about 12 months that you see a decrease in neurofilament light chain. So it takes about a year for this to correct, uh, though there is a wide range in the data. So again, it's not perfect, but it takes that long to correct. And by two years, you get better correction. So you can see what a slow moving process this is from the time of transplant to brain engraftment to correction of uh, biomarkers to uh, disease stabilization. And so in a subset of gene therapy patients, we did the same thing, and we pretty much see the same trend. We see elevation six months after transplant, again, probably due to the chemotherapy. Uh, it stays a little elevated for the first year, but then finally at about that two-year point, we see this very nice correction of neural fibonacci light chain where people's values are lower than when they started with, which is actually what you want to see with the disease stabilization. So pretty interesting. And now we can, we can say that, yes, this biomarker responds to therapy. So buried within the data, there is a progression question too. So this is the gene therapy data published in 2017. And on the x-axis of, of this is the less scores of patients, or are the, uh, the time and the less scores on the y. This is neurologic function score. And what's, uh, what I'm trying to point out here is there was one patient who didn't respond very well to gene therapy, and you can see they, they have progression on MRI and in uh, neurologic, neurologic function. The patient ultimately went on to an allo transplant. But what's interesting is that having his samples, we can actually go back and see, well, what was his neural filament light chain doing at this time? And lo and behold, it lines up very nicely 
that while his MRI was increasing in score, neurofilament light chain also was going up. And I think that lends itself to now the robustness of this type of a marker. So we can demonstrate that, yes, it's associated with all the manifestations of disease, uh, it's associated with the extent of disease, and it responds to therapeutic intervention, either allotransplant or gene therapy. So in conclusion, uh, neurofilament light chain continues to show promise as a blood-based biomarker, again associated with extent of disease and response to therapy. The goal of uh, cerebral disease uh, arrest, it's achieved both by gene therapy or allotransplant. Uh, the neurofilament light chain kinetics may be a little bit different between those two modalities, but maybe someday we could use neurofilament light chain to make decisions about patients. And I, I think about the hard to treat patients or the tricky ones, those with intermediate less scores of eight or nine, which are right on the, on the verge of getting symptoms. Um, what about low risk patients? Uh, is there a certain cutoff at which patients are going to progress rapidly or slowly? I, I mean, a cutoff for the neurofilament. So that's what I look for is for questions in the future. And the next steps for us and, and my working group, we you know, will continue to collaborate with Bluebird Bio and colleagues to drill down on the neurofilament light chains. We can see after transplant, this is just a subset of the data. And what's great is the, the trial, the first trial, ALD-102, is really an exciting opportunity to study neurofilament light chain because of the detailed level of information. Every patient was followed so closely with uh, biomarkers, with scans, with physical exams, is that uh, we'll be able to tie this all together. And we really don't do this in standard of care, even our own transplant center. I end up seeing kids annually after transplant, but that's really not enough to do such robust science. So I'm excited to drill down on that with the data we have from ALD-102. And of course, outside of transplant, we continue to look at and collect samples from our registry studies so we can follow kids through time and see what their biomarker does through the timing within their life, um, especially in the first 10 years. But that'll take 10 years, obviously. So thank you to the families who participate in their research. Thank you to Bluebird Bio for their collaboration, lab staff, lab staff and the funding store sources that listed. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lund. Questions? I saw this hand first, and then we'll go to you, Amber. I'm Vinod. I'm Vinod Prasad. Uh, Troy, fantastic work. I just want to congratulate you on this groundbreaking work, both on the NFL and looking at the outcomes and correlating that with the neurofilament uh, light chains, as well as the impact of conditioning on the level of brain engraftment. And I think those two issues are going to, or two pieces of information are going to really improve the outcomes of transplant as well as gene therapy. So I just wanted to congratulate you. And now just speaking, not as a senior medical director of Bluebird Bio, but as a professor at Duke, um, as a transplanter, um, Many years ago, uh, in a patient with type A disease who we had transplanted, the patient had passed away and the family had donated the brain and we were able to show that there were donor-derived cells, just by XY fish, that there were donor-derived cells in the brain. But that was one patient, one anecdote. Now to take it to this next level, I think is fantastic. So thank you very much. Data came from Seattle. The Seattle group out there had conquered this, where I mean, most of us that have tried it failed, but, but it's really remarkable. Yeah, I'll repeat. This is unbelievably phenomenal work. And the question I'm going to ask you, maybe I want more data, as you do, and it takes mm -hmm. time, but do you have any early insight to patients that are being monitored pre-lesion, yeah. and if, it, if it's an, if, will it come in early? You know where I'm going. I, will I it be earlier before you see the lesion? Uh, right. So, boy, there, there are several an answers to that. One is that people always talk about predictive markers. And, and I always say, none of this is predictive, because every time I show a dot with neurofilament light chain and a dot with a less score, they're obtained at the same time. So I'm drawing blood while they're in the machine. So it's not like I'm predicting anybody's getting anything. 
Um, so we have to kind of move from that paradigm. Uh, it's difficult because, um, you know, eventually we're going to probably answer the question. I know Florian's collecting samples, Ali, Patty Mussolino, the Amsterdam group. We are, you need a cohort of boys followed for probably for 10 years. And then the sampling is critical. Once a year sampling is probably too infrequent. Um, I don't know what the right number is, but if you, if you do this as a thought experiment, what you'd want is daily sampling and then an MRI to change months later. I mean, that's the thought experiment that would be done. That's, of course, not feasible, but that's the kind of thing that we need to uh, practice. So more frequent sampling, basically. And I don't know how to do that. Our patients, my patients get, get tired of coming to me as it is. So, um, but th that's the only way to do it. But hopefully through a large international collaboration and collecting enough patients and data points, we'll get some semblance that maybe this is uh, a bit more predictive and less associative. Because that would be great if I, if I could say, let's just use neural filament chain, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll not do the MRI, or we'll measure your neural filament light chain, I'll get the result tomorrow. If it's high, we'll do the MRI. Like, I can see that kind coming, but not, not next year, but, but eventually we'll get there. Hey, uh, Troy. Yep. Back here in the back. Um, uh, uh, fantastic, and I think we'll really change the field of monitoring these boys um, uh, after newborn screening. I wonder what you think about neurofilament light chain in the setting of advanced cerebral ALD, uh, knowing that you you don't get engraftment unless you. Um, use full myeloblation, knowing that full myeloblation has, you know, has a, has a price upon the brain. Mm -hmm. That those th th there there is um, also some harm that is done before good comes, and those boys are particularly vulnerable. Can we understand what the impact is of conditioning upon neurofilament light chain? Can we understand how much resilience there may be? Um, and select the right boys that still with a less score of 11 might benefit. Um, any thoughts there? Oh my. Two things we can, we can, you know, I'm excited to continue to work with Bluebird on this because we have samples um, very frequently. I showed you 6, 12, and 24 months. I actually have all the intervening points too. So Vinod and I will have to talk about kind of, and they've, they've all been measured. So we can look at the effect of chemotherapy on those samples particularly, but those are scores from zero to nine. For advanced boys, um, I think it would be reasonable. We don't see as many transplants anymore for boys from 11 to 14, um, but uh, so I I'm not sure exactly how to do the analysis. I, their neurofilament light chain is higher, I know that, so it probably drops further. The other thing is in the um, German paper, they did uh, less score to neuromal filament light chain actually is a, uh, a curve that ends up going down at the end of it. So scores in the 20s and 25 range actually had a little bit lower neurofilament light chain. Um, and I don't know what that's about. There were very few boys, but I wonder if that's something about you only, you can reach some kind of concentration maximum and any more damage beyond that doesn't really change because you're already maxed out. Um, so, but there's more there to learn. You know, of course, boys uh, with scores of 15 and higher, it's a pretty tough transplant discussion. We actually don't have it anymore because, like you said, the damage from the transplant itself just pushes them over the edge. So, thank you very much for presenting, Dr. Lund. Um, as people living in the Seattle area, Alex and I were kind of wondering, what is the team in Seattle that was doing this research? Uh, what is the team? You know, I, I became, they presented this data at a major meeting two years ago, and it, after, it was after I had failed miserably trying to do this, and I, you know, found them. And they're, they're a mixture of people interested in transplant, but uh, they're mostly scientists, and there was only one clinician on the team. The, I think the implication is um, transplanting cells and doing cellular therapy is going beyond ALD. People are starting to entertain this for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. 
Um, and so they're talking about different cellular therapies. And of course, you'd need a biomarker to measure it, and you'd need to measure uh, cell engraftment in the brain. And that was their um, impetus for doing it, is establishing that. Um, of course, the problem is, and I showed you, is that it's the chemo and the radiation that it seems to be necessary for now. We just, we, that's what we have to do, and you don't necessarily want to do that to an older population of people uh, if you're just trying to engraft their brain. But that was the starting point, and they knocked it out of the park. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Lund. Um, I have a question about the transplant, actually. Has anyone looked at, or do we know in diseases with severe neuroinflammation, if the engraftment in the brain changes? Um, you mean would be higher or something? That, that, that would be the hypothesis, but yeah. has anybody actually looked at that? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I don't think it's higher, frankly. And that's just my gut instinct. All these patients I showed you probably had leukemia. Now, if they would have had ALD, just because the vessels are a little leaky, do you think it's higher? I don't think so, because um, we transplant other neurologic diseases where there's no gallium enhancement. So it's not like the gallium enhancement says, let's have this big giant bolus of cells come in and graft the brain. Um, it's because it's a slow process. That's one thing I didn't go into is that I used to think engraftment happened on the day of transplant. Like it just, the cells went up there. It turns out it doesn't happen. It actually takes weeks for it to happen. And you have to engraft your marrow before your brain. So that's mandatory. If you don't engraft your marrow, nothing gets to the brain. And so there's so much we don't know, but we do understand that timing. And then lastly, I've looked at the ALD mice. They don't necessarily engraft their brains faster than any other mouse. Though they don't have a, they're not a good model for brain disease, as we know. Troy, thank you so much for uh, too close to the microphone uh, for for the talk and again walking us through what we know, what we don't, what we need to go. How far do you think we are, or is anyone doing the engineering of the bone marrow precursor CD thirty four to engraft without chemo? You presented several years ago some strategies. Yeah. to increase engraftment. Like, if the, in cell therapy, the bigger um, funnel is going to be chemo mm -hmm. causing damage or mortality or morbidity, where are we at on trying to get cells without chemo to engraft in bone marrow? Is there any engineering, any receptor, anything you could put in these cells to make <laughs> them go what you want <laughs> and compete to the yeah. home bone marrow to this kind of displace them nicely without creating... <laughs> Right. A leukemia? Right. Now, are, are, you, are you baiting me to comment on the uh, experimental medicine paper that came out with CSFR1 mutation? Be my guest, but oh, I wasn't yes. aiming for it. Oh. <laughs> I was not thinking about yeah. that. I was just thinking about what I don't read. Got it. Like, oh, yes. I, don't, don't, don't go there. I just assume <laughs> you're... I mean, it's a landmark paper. It came from UC Irvine. Um, this... There, there are drugs called uh, plexins, pexidartnib, that you can give people. They're, it's for tumors, but it lowers your microglia. Like it, it wipes them out, and it's a safe drug. And, um, and, and we do this in the, in the mice all the time. Like There are mouse models. If you give them pexidartnib, you can get 100% of graph in the brain. It's very easy. So the group at UC Irvine actually created a cell, and I think it came from IPC, and they created a cell with a mutated CSF1R that was resistant to the drug, but the idea is that they will give the drug to mice, give the mice the cells that are resistant to the drug, and all those cells go to the brain and replace the microglia. And they're still on the drug, and since the cells that they gave are resistant, they repopulate, and the mice are well. Totally works. I mean, this amazing paper in JXMED. Getting that to work in a human being is their next step. And that's that, you know, there's, first it's an IPSC, so that's not easily given to humans yet. It is a manufactured CSF1R that's mutated, which apparently is functional, but um, they're right there on the verge. Um, really a nice paper this year. So very dense, but um, yeah, that's, it's been done. <laughs> so. Any other questions? 
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lund.